Lord Emulation, uh, Immolation, excuse me. Um, thanks for the reply. I am happy to respond to it. Um, one thing you asked is what exists? What is my ontology? So I'll tell you. First, I am starting from an ontology that begins just with a stream of perceptions. And in that stream of perceptions, I define me, not necessarily I, but me as the passive subject, um, experiencing perceptions, a stream of perceptions. Um, there's also an implication of memory, right? Because how do I know it, of it as a stream except for that I remember older parts? So there's basically me with some sort of ability to get perceptions, both current perceptions, perceptions that are either perceptions from the past or regenerated. And, um, and that's the ontology. Of course, from that, I intend to regain all of science, and, and uh, because science is based entirely on perceptions. That's the point of empiricism. Um, now, I do not say at all that it is the act of perception or the intentionality or the fact that there's a will. It is the interactivity. Now, when you say what would exist if you cease to exist, well, then we can say that, that the answer to that is undefined. What, what exists in a space beyond your uh, ability to interact with? Again, undefined, all right? Um, but that's not saying that you simply cease to per perceive. If you cease to perceive, let's say that all your senses are severed, um, you will still be interacting with the world around you. And those relative interactions are still physical, and so there's, it's quite easy to say that without your will, I would conceive of you as still being, you know, having these interactions. I mean, why, what else would, would I think about that? Um, but if you were to cease your interactions with the universe around you, well, that would be different. And that's why we cannot make these absolute uh, terms. Now, you talked about the fact that I say there's no absolute truth might be an absolute. And this is an old canard, and there's really a couple different, uh, I, I don't think it's that big of a problem in the end, but I mean, it's, it's, it's a good point to think through, but there's a couple important things. I mean, one is just in general, this is like if I say everything is an approximation, you're going to tell me that that's a certainty. So we, we ha do have a certainty. So not everything is an approximation because we have the certainty that everything's an approximation. And it's, this is similar to if you have objective truths where, you know, I've had people say this, objectivists, it's like, well, yeah, everything's relative. You know, all truth is relative to some frame of reference and criteria and all these. But, but, you know, it's objectively so. And this is, you know, this is just a way of uh, keeping a hold of this idea of objectivity. If everything is an approximation, you say, well, that's a certainty. But everything is approximate still, right? So, you know, the rhetorical, the, the, the linguistic feature of that being seeming like certainty because it's always true it's not quite the same thing as what we're talking about with an objective truth, um, you know, by any means. Um, but also, you know, the, the point of no absolute truths, that is a truth that's still relative. You can say that it sounds absolute if you put in an absolutist interpretation on that sentence. But if you're a skeptic and a relativist, then that means that there are no absolutes. And the truth of that is still relative. Okay, that is still not an absolute. For one thing, our understanding of what it means for there to be no absolutes is going to change. Why? Because our concept of nothing and absolutes and existence are getting refined. Those terms are not absolute. And therefore, a statement with those terms is still not going to be absolute. And that will pretty much always hold. But more importantly, I think it's to separate ourselves from the word sometimes and think about what these things mean. And if I say everything's an approximation and you want to say, well, there's a certainty that everything's an approximation, you don't get your certainties back that way. Everything still is approximate. I still am correct. And in a world of absolute certainty, it's like, oh, well, yeah, but I've proved that this case proves that, that you're wrong. Well, I'm not trying to make absolute statements, though, am I? I'm not trying to say that the idea that uh, there are no absolutes, doesn't have a contradiction, especially that it doesn't have some trivial linguistic contradiction. I'm saying conceptually, everything is an approximation. That may, r remains true. That remains true. Okay, the exception does not disprove that assertion because the assertion is an empirical assertion. Uh, look at all of the truths that we have, and none of them are absolute, and they're all relative. 
Um, it's more speculation for me to guess that they're going to continue to be relative. Um, and I'm making a guess. And I don't believe that that is absolutely true. I believe that that's theoretical. I just am willing to take that guess and see how it fares. So maybe, maybe you'll find something absolute, at which point I'll change my mind. But it has yet to happen, and there's good reasons to think that it can't happen. You ask me what does it mean then for something to be false? Well, I told you my ontology is our perceptions. And so what it means for something to be false is that it does not cohere with the consistent perceptions that we get. So in the perceptions that we, we have a perceptive uh, mechanics, techniques for uh, testing our perceptions into which are consistent with themselves, with other perceptions. And this is how we judge if something is true or false. So a statement is true if it coheres with the actual uh, perceptions that, that I have, you know, including my perceptions about which perceptions are reliable and so forth. Okay, that is how I define true for myself. And people often get confused about subjectivity, thinking that that means that anything the subject says uh, it goes and is true. But a subject can say, oh, it takes 10, ball, 10 seconds for a ball to drop from any height. I can ask them, well, have you tested that? I can say, show me your clock. There's all kinds of things I can ask about, well, really, did you? Even though that is a single uh, agent, that doesn't mean that they have actually been careful with their perceptions. Now, when I say that solipsism is my basic uh, epistemology, that, that there's a solipsistic epistemology, obviously, if you're going to make solipsism a conclusion, then you never get to that step of admitting there's other brains. That's what solipsism means in that sense. But what, the way I'm talking about it is just that, again, ontologically, we have a solipsistic experience. That is our direct experience, is, is being me receiving or being immersed in or some other, uh, some other relationship to uh, the perceptions. So there's me and perceptions. And, uh, and so that's just the ontology, and in that ontology, we only have ourselves. You know, I, I experience my own will, you know, again, as the next level of epistemology, before I realize there's other wills, you know, as a will because I have perceptions that seem like, you know, that are what we call willing and seem like there's choice involved. Like I can choose to remember, um, you know, a photo or uh, an object, I could say diamond, I can pull up a picture of a diamond. It seems like I've done that intentionally. And um, I can't be sure. Some people argue there is no will. But it appears to me that, that I am choosing these things. And I'm just saying that that's primary. Once I realize that and I have a model for what it means to choose, meaning what it means for me to choose, you know, then I have that in my ontology. Then I can start applying that to these batches of sense perceptions and say, look, this batch of sense perceptions is associated with something else that has will. So I see a bunch of uh, colors and hear some sounds and uh, I associate those all together and I see a person. And I associate with that person, which is for me a, sense, a, a set of perceptions, the idea that it's also a subject, that it has its own will, its own intentionality, and that is jumping beyond solipsism. I do admit that's a separate thing. Okay, there's nothing in, in the epistemology that makes you accept that. I don't believe that is something that epistemologically we get directly enough to be forced merely by our primary experience of sensing perceptions into granting that other people have their reality. I think it's much more practical than that. I think, okay, first of all, we have genetic predispositions to realize that these are people, that these are parents and family and whatnot, and have empathy. Okay, so that is a powerful force. And then also, we have um, just uh, the practicality of living in a group. If we treat other people like they're just inanimate objects and aren't really making decisions, and they're telling us, no, I want you to treat me like a person, and we're going, no, I'm going to treat you just like an inanimate bunch of perceptions that just happens to you know, be like you are, you know, I'm, we're not, I'm not going to have good interpersonal relationships. Does that sound like a good philosophical reason to believe something? Um, doesn't really matter. I'm only adopting this solipsistic approach because I don't think I have another choice. I believe that's all I know in my primary experiences is that I am here as a perceiver of some sort. And um, I have to accept whatever is, is the best I can do. So the best I can do is to say that I have kind of a tertiary reason to grant um, 
you know, to grant an idea that the 